Teaching Lab. It's Friday morning, and for those of you who have not been to the After Teaching Lab before, online perhaps, watching us live, um, the After Teaching Lab is the weekly space that we come to uh, every week on Fridays during the semesters, and we ask an instructor to come in and talk about how they use the technology to teach. So, what are the things that they wanted? What was the challenge that they had? That caused them to change their way of teaching and use technology? What are the things that they tried? Um, what other options were there? What did they go through? Um, what happened? Was it an administrator's nightmare? Did the <laughs> students revolt? Um, was it terrible? Was it easy? Was it good? And then, based on that, lessons learned, or what would they do next time? Um, we often have a hands on activity, and you can see that you should all have an activity sheet with some easy things to try, some medium things to try, and sometimes we have difficult things to try. Those are things that we haven't figured out yet, but maybe some of you guys are. Yes. We know that you are. Um, oh, and then we unpack the pedagogy and we discuss why is this a good thing, why is it, why would we do this? We've had a lot of these now in our sixth semester, and we've covered a lot of topics already. Um, and it's okay if you missed these because we have videos for all of them, and you can go back and catch the videos if you're interested. Um, speaking of videos, today we're live streaming. I say this a little bit of editing time. It's actually cut down like two hours a week of PDH time, so that's going to be And it also lets people who want to be here Friday morning, but they can't, they can just get online and watch it there. But they don't get coffee and bagels, so mm -hmm. you should keep on coming because you get coffee and bagels. Um, this is our semester schedule. We're already up to um, asynchronous discussion. And next week, in the past I said that it was going to be December 8th, but we did our math wrong. We went great for labs. The next week will be our 100th lab. That's kind of a milestone for us. So we've been doing this quite a while now. Um, like many of the university programs, we get judged by impact, and one of the easiest ways to measure impact is how many people show up. So bring them up. Tell people about it. If you are interested in, in this type of thing, and you know somebody who's been using Canvas, especially any of these tools in Canvas, please let me know who they are so that I can contact them and say, hey, come talk to us in spring about the about your use of Ultra conference or chat for outcomes or master paths or advanced quizzing or templates, etc. Uh, these little green sheets that you have on your table are evaluations, and at the end of the day, at the end of the session, if you could tell us um, how today was, what you'd like to see, what worked, what didn't work, things like that, um, that helps us sort of keep a, our tab on the pulse of things, and we make adjustments accordingly, right? So we try to be responsive to you. Um, if you've come more than three times or so, you might be able to get one of these little badges. So it's, it's kind of like a little club, it's actually is what it turns out to be. Um, please, when you leave, drop them off. And if you'd like, we've got an active teaching lab Canvas course where we can get in and play around with some of these things. Although one of the best advantages of it, really, if, even if we don't do anything in Canvas, um, there is all of the links on the activity sheet are live there, whereas on the paper, they're not live. Someday, though. Someday, if we'll get to that point. Um, we are not taking applications for Blend at UW for this January. Uh, we have two sessions, January 9th through the 12th and 16th through the 19th. Any of you, have you taken these sessions? And thumbs up, yeah? OK, they're useful. And it's a four-day intensive, uh, fairly intensive, Four day session, they used to be five day session, and they make it more intensive to give you Friday off. So, if, if you want to learn the, sort of the pedagogy behind you letting your course and how to do that, these are really good sessions for that. All right, that's what I have today. And I'll introduce yourself. Is it in there? Sure. All right, so hopefully I got my uh, notifications turned off so we're not notified when I get an email. Uh, but we'll see. So thanks for coming today. My name is Karen Spader. 
I'm a doctoral student in curriculum and instruction in the digital media focus area. And, and my area of study is online learning in higher education. Uh, more specifically to that, I'm particularly interested in how we can create online courses to be more socially engaging. Uh, and so today I'm here to talk to you about my experience this semester with the course I'm a TA for using asynchronous discussions, specifically with the kind of goal of helping students improve their writing. So the situation that we have, the course is an undergraduate combi course. At the end, by the way, I'll have my contact information if you're interested in contacting me. So the undergraduate course, it's a combi course, so it's a heavy, a writing intensive course. Uh, the course is video games and learning. And I have two sections. What I'm talking about today is what I set up was kind of a two format, same activity, so that I could compare the impact and the results that I had. And so basically I had one of my sections engage in these activities face to face in the classroom, and the other section engaged in the same activities but using the asynchronous discussions. But both had the same learning goal to improve their writing skills through doing peer review activities. So most of my presentation today is gonna focus on what happened in the online course or online format, uh, because I think that you know, leads lends to the asynchronous discussions better. But I also surveyed the students and got some of their feedback, and so I'll, I'll present the findings from both sections broken out. Okay, so the activities. There are two main activities. For, again, for the online section, the first thing I did was I recorded a voiceover PowerPoint kind of how-to directions, guidelines, using Ultra Conference. I'm not going to talk about Ultra Conference here, but it looks like they're looking for someone to present on using Ultra Conference, so maybe I will come back to that. Um, but the first activity was a free writing activity, and the first thing, of course, you think about is, all right, free writing in class, you tell students to start your computers, take out a piece of paper, and start writing, or write on your computers either way. And that was how I did this with the face-to-face -face course. I said, all right, Put all your stuff away, you're gonna write for 10 minutes. But online, I have to trust that they're going to do this on their own. And I, you know, after I finished the survey, I was like, why didn't I ask if honestly they did it without looking at their notes? But I didn't, so I don't know. Uh, but anyway, the free writing activity, they had 10 minutes to write an introduction. What I found in one of their early assignments was that they weren't introducing the concepts, they were just diving right into the concepts. So I wanted to have an activity where they would spend some time developing an overall introduction to lead it into it. So I know this is small, and we'll share the slides with you on the active teaching lab. But basically, this is the instruction area of an asynchronous discussion board, uh, discussion thread. And this is both typed and embedded information to guide them. And it basically prompts them that, and I described all this in the Ultra Conference video as well. But it tells them, okay, you're going to write an introduction without using any of your notes, any of the readings, just write what comes to your mind. And I encourage them, I told them this in the recording, but also here again in the text, that this is a really great activity to exercise your understanding of concepts, to just write, right? I think so many students get caught up in making sure it sounds right or looks right or uses the right words, they don't trust their own understanding. And so this was the intent behind this activity. But beyond that was also to share with each other how different people interpreted these concepts that they're all supposed to be using. So I embedded a timer, a 10-minute timer, right into this, and they can click their reply and start the 10 minutes and type, and then it would make a when it was over. And I gave them uh, additional kind of prompts or questions to think about while they write. So that was the first activity. Um, also, you know, on the activity sheet, it mentions <coughs> anchored discussions. This is a good, embedding like this is a good strategy for using an anchored discussion to really anchor the discussion into a specific content area. I see a lot of discussions that get posted that are like, talk about the readings. That's really overwhelming to students, particularly undergrads. Unfortunately, graduate students just write really, really long posts. So it's not good for either, but nonetheless. Um, the anchor to f anchored give them something really specific to focus on. But anyway, we can move on from that. So that was the first activity. The second activity, oh, by the way, this was set up 
for my section, this section was 18 students, so all 18 students were in the same discussion thread. The second activity, though, they were broken out into groups of three or four. At the beginning of the semester, I put students at tables with four people apiece. They had two dropouts, so there are two groups that have only three. But So there are four people apiece right at the beginning of the semester, and that's their small group for the whole semester. I think, particularly with online, it's really important to establish close relationship groups because a lot of research has indicated that students in online courses feel pretty alienated. They feel like they're, there's nobody really there with them, and that's been a real concern and has been argued to maybe contribute to higher attrition rates in online courses. So anyway, I think it's good anyway, but nonetheless. <coughs> so this is among their three, four person group, this activity. So here, they'd already written a portion of their paper, and so I had them post up a segment of their paper, whatever one they wanted, I encouraged them to use one that they really needed work on. Post the segment of their paper, and then I gave them the control Assign two reviewers per person. I gave them some advice, A, B, C, D, A does B and C, and so on and so forth. Um, and then, in the slideshow that I refer to here, I gave them some kind of steps for engaging in a peer review. Um, and again, I'm not gonna go over what that, that whole presentation was. But basically, so, you know, a lot of students don't know how to do peer review. Um, some of them think that all you're supposed to do is copy edit and say, period here, this is misspelled. So I gave them some clear direction on that. Uh, and then, so I said, all right, so now you gotta give a peer review uh, to at least, let's see, I think I said two people a piece. Oh yeah, I said that up there. And then engage in a little back and forth. So those were what the activities were. Um, I also, by the way, set up groups in Canvas, which that is also not something I'm here to talk about, but I'm happy to talk to you about that if you want insight into how that worked out. So what happened? The first activity, there was a lot of, this is really good, which is something that a lot of people hate about using asynchronous discussions, because it's not depth of content, depth of thought, and, and support. But in the presentation, I was really clear, what is, what is the purpose of giving peer feedback, right? Not only are you tasked with just reading somebody else's activity, this isn't just a job to you, this actually is beneficial for your own writing because you're exposed to the way other people format their writing, the way other people interpret the same concepts that you're using, and this can be really beneficial. So I was really, I guess, I really emphasized why we do peer feedback. It was really explicit about that. And I actually think that after looking over what happened, I think that it was effective to some extent based on some of the comments people were giving. But a lot of, this is really good, but there was some good elaboration and lessons. Hey, I learned this from you. So I've pulled a few examples. Uh, so this person is saying, I like how you explained a specific principle. Mind you, this is for the general introduction free write activity. So someone said, I liked how you did specific principles. It gave me a clear introduction. Um, and also I liked how you brought it into the classroom, applied in an everyday classroom. If you guys aren't familiar, by the way, this is uh, G's learning principles. Uh, what is it? Good learning principles, or how does he cite, state that title? Principles of good learning and good video games. Right, yeah, principles of good learning and good video games. Not good grammar, but that's okay. No good grammar. <laughs> um, so anyway, so that's what they're writing about. This one, again, this is a really good response. Uh, I'm impressed that you remembered so many of the specific principles. Right here, this tells me perhaps people were a little laying it on thick to say, we didn't use our notes at all, but that's just my assumption. Uh, <laughs> listing them, putting them into categories was helpful. Uh, it's interesting you drew connecting to the college experience, I agree. It's interesting how to see how I could apply them to my own schoolwork. So again, lessons being learned, new thought processes being brought up. Um, Summary did a nice job of highlighting. I like how you took it a step further, applied to the classroom environment. Um, which is something the author discusses, but not something we discussed in class, so I thought that was nice. I agree if we apply them to a real educational environment, we'd see great results, so application of these concepts, which is nice. Um, despite this one being short, it offers some constructive feedback. I like how you did this, but how can we, 
How can the principles be used outside of analyzing video games? So encouraging that the, the peer to think bigger. I totally agree, again. <laughs> they give insight into different ways we can learn from video games that aren't applicable in other settings, and they shed light on the value that we can extract from playing them into learning opportunities. So again, really positive, but you're seeing some of that constructive feedback, uh, you know, lessons being learned, additional encouragement. So the second activity, there were a lot more specific suggestions being brought up. So here we're looking at, they posted an actual segment of their paper to get feedback on. Again, they were couched in this positivity, but I think that's good. I also kind of think, contribute this to the fact that in the, that slideshow that I did, uh, I put the definition of constructive um, and, and, and told them about how it's important that you're not mean, right, but that you are still critical, and that's a good thing. So I saw that come through a lot. So here we have some examples. Uh, it really made the paper flow, but you didn't cite your sources, so that's great advice. Uh, it might be more credible if you incorporated those citations. It would be even stronger if you explained them more, as if the reader has never heard of these principles before reading this paper. But overall, the job, the flow was great. So that's really great, because that's something that I continue to find myself telling my students. When you're writing a paper, I know you have in your mind that you're writing it for me. And of course, I'm the teacher, so I know these concepts. But you have to show me that you know them. So it's better to write as if you're writing to someone who's never read or doesn't know these concepts. So I saw that coming through. Um, it got, I got through to them there. So here we have de detailed description. Puts me in the scene. That's nice. Uh, specific to one particular principle they wrote about. I thought it was good. He gave examples. Um, not da, 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 da. I think you have a good descriptive paragraph here, but might want to relook at your definition. So you did a good job with the example, and I think it's accurate, but you didn't quite define it well enough for the, for the person. So again, specific information is really good. Um, here we have it's game, your description's vivid, straightforward. It'd be better if you could introduce the game name at first. Again, setting up that scene. First paragraph um, was good. It was a specific example or experience. But I'm confused about your third paragraph. Are you still talking about this one principle, or is it a new principle, or just your experience? So this person says, I think it would be better if you could connect it specifically. Keep working. So that's really great encouragement. I was excited to see that one. This one's a little bit longer, but we can pick out a few things here. Um, you go in depth. Da, 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 da. Grammar, overall quality of writing was, was excellent. The hardest part is the bridge between explaining the game to the audience, incorporating the principles, and pushing further into how those principles can be implemented implemented into real world settings. And that part is the hardest, and probably all of us could use some more depth. Uh, so I thought that was really great because it's both indicating, hey, you've got work here, but don't feel bad about it. I think it applies to all of us, so I thought that was really nice. Um, and then they bring out a specific thing that person says, and they say, I think this is great, but you can expand further on it, and similar points in each paragraph would take your paper to the next level, giving the reader the so what. I just really loved that comment. I thought it was really great. And then this last one here, this is the shortest post reply feedback out of all of the 18 on the 18 students. There was more than 18. Some people posted more than once. But anyway, I think you did a good job in describing. I think you can have more examples, more details on how you find the situation pleasantly frustrating, which is one of the principles. So all of these examples, there was not a single reply on this activity that didn't offer some advice, some tangible something that someone could work in the stuff on in the stuff that they posted. And that made me really happy. Um, and let's now move to what feedback the students gave me on these surveys. So the green here is the online and the blue is the face-to-face. -face. This was the number of reviews that the student gave. I had 30 students who completed the survey out of 38. Note. Um, so you can see that in the online section, more students gave two uh, reviews. In the face-to-face -face session, more gave only one. And I think that's not surprising, given the fact that in class we have 75 minutes. 
and online they had a week. Uh, for re receiving feedback, uh, again, we see the same kind of pattern. Online, more people received two. On face-to-face, -face, more people received one. And in online, one person got three pieces of feedback. So that's good. Um, and here's the question for this one, thinking about the free writing activity, that first one about G's principles, the introduction. How much did your understanding of this key course concept change? And I know these are really small, I don't like that. But this top one is, my understanding didn't change at all. I'm still confused. Uh, so it looks like we have one person, and they were from the online, the is online. For my understanding did not change, I was already confident with these principles. <coughs> Decent, four online, three face-to-face. -face. And then, of course, these other two down here. My, under my understanding changed some but I still have some work to do before being confident. This was obviously the biggest one, face-to-face -face and online, and my understanding changed a lot. I feel a lot better about how well I understand these concepts. Uh, so we had two in the face-to-face -face and four online. So taken together, we have well over half of the students who are seeing improvement. And if we were to drop off the people who already got it, yeah, it would be over three quarters, so. So that's good, that's promising, right? I, I think that in both formats, we're seeing improvement in understanding through this activity. This one is what kinds of feedback did you receive? And it sure would have been nice if I would have planned to have this one refer to that one. And of course they don't, so they're all squiggled up. So I'll, I'll explain. So most comments were superficial. I was really interested to know this one, particularly for comparing the online to the face-to-face. -face. Uh, and that's this one right here. And face-to-face -face is orange, online is blue again. So we had about eight people in face-to-face, -face. also these are check all that apply, make note of that. Eight people in face-to-face -face got superficial comments, mostly, uh, and only four in the online. So I found that interesting. Uh, let's see, suggestions for improving my application of concept, these, that's these ones over here. So clear suggestions for improve, improving application of those concepts, uh, a little more in the face-to-face. This one over here is improving interpretations, explanations, justifications. This one was the highest one, which I was really excited about because I think this is the most important one, right? Application is one thing, but interpretation is always more difficult. So we saw really high response rates there. And then this one is structural organizational feedback. And down here is spelling. Hardly anybody got comments on spelling, grammar, that kind of stuff. So, I was like, that's awesome. This seemed to be pretty effective, at least in terms of the feedback that they gave me. Um, this is uh, how helpful they found these peer review activities. So we have the online is the green, and the blue is the face-to-face. -face. Uh, pretty similar, little ups and downs. So you know, some people more so than other people. Um, but it seems that generally online found it more helpful than the face-to-face. And that was about helpfulness, so this one is about enjoyment, so I don't know why I included this. I was just curious how much they enjoyed these activities. Um, and this one, I don't think we can draw much of anything. We have some, I think we have some higher ratings online than we had in face-to-face, -face. Um, but overall, I'd say it's probably about equal. Um, so next time, so that was what I did, and that was kind of what happened. Next time, will I do this again? Yeah, absolutely. For one, I think that, you know, well, it's kind of the world that I'm studying. I, I teach, I've taught a lot of classes online, and I'm, I know that students are drawn to using this digital media, particularly undergraduate students right now. Uh, and I think that it can be really effective given that we design for it correctly. So will I do it again? Yeah. I also know students if they plan to incorporate their feedback that they got in these activities. Overall, 80% said yep. Only four people said maybe, and two people said no. So that's good. Uh, I did pull out the average rank of helpfulness across both classes, it was 7.1. We had slightly higher in the online than it was in the face-to-face. -face. And I'll give you a, a student comment on the next slide that may allude to why. Uh, and then join it again, it was about even, 6.8 to 6.5 across the two different sections and 6.7 overall. So what will I change? I will provide some more detailed guidelines and clearer expectations. I thought I was being pretty clear, but after hearing a couple of comments, one student said, I think I was able to add a lot of value to the person I peer reviewed, however, I received little value. But I still found it helpful because assisting another student reinforced my own understanding. Okay, 
So I think a little more expectation, uh, a little clearer guidelines might ensure that everybody gets better feedback. And then this person from a face-to-face -face section said, face-to-face -face feedback was nice, but we didn't write anything down that way, and so I f forgot some of it. I was like, yeah, I didn't really think about that. That's a huge value of using the online format because everything is archived by its nature. So I think that given if I were to do face-to-face, -face, make sure that there's something where they're getting it out on a paper, clearly making sure that everybody's getting those details down. Um, on the other hand, maybe it is another reason why I should use the online format instead of the face-to-face. -face. So, different ways to think about it. Uh, creating a rubric, leading, adding on to that. One student said, without a rubric, it was hard to give and receive specific feedback. So again, this is about expectations and guidelines. I think if there was a clear rubric that would help alleviate this comment, it get stuff written down, and it would help students scaffold what exactly it is they need to be doing in these, in these uh, activities. And then the last thing is the question of to grade or not to grade. The reason why I did this was because I was going on a, a vacation, a mini vacation over the weekend, and I had a Thursday section, and I don't want to just not have them do something. And so that week, the Tuesday while I was still there, we did the face-to-face, -face, and the Thursday while I was gone, we did it online. And um, this wasn't graded. It was only you need to participate in this activity because it means you were present that day. It, it is your participation. Uh, so it's just counted in their participation grade for the semester. It wasn't graded differently or exclusively in any way. Um, so what impact did that have on participation? Online, only one student didn't post. That's pretty good. So. You know, you have one student not to come to class all the time. It's nothing to really worry about. Two didn't receive any feedback at all, and that was in the small groups. Both of those students were late posters, though. So I think there's, again, guidelines. Make sure you post by this date, and then start your feedback on the next date. And something like that might have gotten rid of that problem. Uh, from the large group, the first activity, free writing, three were absent. I say absent. They didn't post. Uh, so that first bullet point was in the small groups. Three didn't post for that, and five didn't receive feedback. Again, they were the last posts on the list. So some, we need a little bit more accountability to think about, I think, there. Uh, and then the other thing that I would change is to enhance the teacher present element, presence element, which is me. I intentionally stayed away from these to see how it would go. Um, we have more peer review activities coming up. This was like the first introduction of getting their feet wet and how to do peer review. So in the future, I would be more present on those as well, adding little bits and encouraging a little bit more. Um, but again, that decision was intentional for this particular activity. So, so that's all I've got for you. Thank you for listening to me. Uh, if you have any questions, here's my contact information, well, my email, and where I live, almost literally where I live in my office right now. Um, yeah, questions that I can answer overall? Yeah. Do you use a like button? I do. Um, I, well, I always activate it. Nobody used it in either of these activities. I didn't mention it, but it's there. I mean, it shows a little like. So, yeah. I actually think it adds just this tiny little element of social presence, uh, which I think is important. Um, so this comes from the community of inquiry model from Garrison and others. I can't think of the others. Um, 2000 piece. Garrison 2000, I've used that citation a lot. So anyway, so yeah, community of inquiry, and they talk about social presence, cognitive presence, and teacher presence. And I think that's just that tiny little like, somebody getting a like, is somebody read my thing. And it's not necessarily a huge effect, but I think it's important, so I always use it. I think that's a huge thing. I mean, it, because it's, it's small but important, because otherwise you can post something, and you're posting into the darkness. Yeah. You, know, you don't know if anyone's listening at all, but seeing that little light, it's like, oh, it's not totally a wasted effort. Somebody read it. And I think like if you're proposing ideas or like crowdsourcing something, and because you can organize them by the number of likes, so that might be a good strategy for that. Yeah. Did you use the like button yourself as an instructor? I didn't, but that's definitely something I could do to show them that I read it. Like I said, I was kind of intentionally just staying away to just see how it organically itself happened. 
Um, but yeah, I think the instructor is a good person to use that as well. Yeah, Julie. Um, I liked uh, that one student response that you highlighted where they asked a question. And it struck me that that might be a way to encourage further engagement sure. among those two students. So mm -hmm. even assigning your students to ask a question of the person they're reviewing and then. Yeah, that's a great idea. It, yeah. it just also seemed like you have to understand the topic or whatever, the, the comment a little bit um, in more depth in right. order to ask a question. Yeah, tell yeah. A question. I think so too. I like that a lot. In the large group format, they were all able to see each other's comments, right? Yeah. So I think this is a nice thing in the online thing. Um, there were a couple of things about online versus face-to-face. -face. One, not writing things down, and that happens all the time. Like, I'm engaged, where I'm listening, and then afterwards I'm like, crap, what did she say? There were so many good points, but there were lots of them, so I kind of didn't write them down because I was face-to-face -face and engaged with that. But that documentation of things is huge. You know, then I can go back and look at it. Two. Being able to see what other people have reviewed and responded sort of sets that bar of what, the, what is my expectation? Is it that short little paragraph or is it the much longer paragraph? Also sort of sets the bar for future responses from students. What I found is that my typically, often, some of the best students, the most engaged students are the ones who do the assignment right away. So they will do you know the more in-depth thing and then the next people will go look at that and say, oh, I've got to do this much, and it has to be this thoughtful or whatever. So that sort of keeps the keeps the quality up. In face to face, you can't hear what other people are saying because you're focused on what you're speaking with your um, group partner. So being able to have that as sort of a reference is kind of a nice a nice way of, of doing that. Do you know like how you put that uh, someone who hasn't posted yet can read the comments and see the high bar. Prior to that, I used only a function that you, you can see the comments after you post. Right. Do you see a value to that? I think, I think sometimes there's a value to that as well. And I think that it's good to sort of have all different types of um, activities in an online space so that it, one, it doesn't seem so boring. You should have repeated ones so that people get used to it. So the first time, I may not know what to do. But the second time, all right, I've had that experience. I can do it again. Um, having that post is good so that people don't copy over the same things that other people said. Or well, they're not scared to say the same thing in their own words. Or they're not scared to say the same thing in their own words. Mm -hmm. um, I will often say, if somebody's made a point already, you can't make that point again. Mm -hmm. Like, And that forces them, one, again, it encourages them to make the easy points right away. And then it encourages, um, <coughs> if, they, if they don't do it right away, and they're late posters, which can really screw things up sometimes, um, then they've got to really think hard about, right, so all of these good points are taken, oh, crap, there's nothing left. I really have to dig deep yeah. now, so it sort of, it punishes them for not being on top of things. <laughs> yeah, I love it. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah, I have a question. Um, you mentioned students talking about in an online discussion and one of the worst kinds of discussion prompts is a factual discussion prompt what did the author mean by X now there's interpretation there but by and large you just get a regurgitation of the author's point over and over and over again um, so and that's what only the your you know if and that's exactly where that comes in helpful, absolutely. Because if if I see that, you know, Karen's, Karen's a good student, she answered right away, and she said, the author means this, so I just have to take what Karen said and re-spin yeah. it so that it sounds like me. Right. But if I can't see that, if it's hidden, then I've got to come up with it, I've got to read it myself, and come up with my own interpretation, but hey. Right. So. so another strategy, though, if you do want to focus on comprehension of a particular piece of material, video, reading, whatever, you could embed it right into the discussion. Or there are other strategies, too. In Canvas, you could embed like a, a doc into a page and use the comment feature. 
So the intent, though, is that the discussion is anchored around a very specific piece of material. So if you were to embed a commentable reading, you could say, all right, everybody has to post either an expa expansion of an, one of the author's points, somewhere that you are confused about an author's points, but you can't double up. So once a section is highlighted and commented on, you have to do something else. So all of the posts are anchored directly to that piece of material. Uh, and so you could use the discussion in that way too, the threaded discussion in that kind of way, right? By embedding that material right in the, dis in the uh, instruction area at the top of the discussion board. Um, whereas, and so in that way, it's anchored to a piece of material, it's still using a threaded discussion functionality, I suppose, but it's anchored specifically to a piece of material. In this case, it was different, right? Because I had them posting their actual work to get peer feedback on. It's just happened to be using the Canvas threaded discussion function, right? So for me, I think we often think about the discussion as merely being a place to rehash the readings or uh, be a platform for demonstrating understanding, comprehension, things like that. Uh, but I'm trying to think of other ways to use it uh, for other purposes, I guess. And there's a variety of purposes for it. And I think they're valuable in different ways. Um, did I get to your point there a little bit? Can you yeah. Be anchored? Yeah. Okay. There's a, uh, I'm going to try to find it right now, but Martin Gernsbacher will use, uh, she does asynchronous, she does all, she only teaches online, and she has her students do a lot of chats um, or discussions. And the way that she often um, structures it is, I'm trying to think of what the different ways are, there's jigsaw where they each read three different things and then they have to come together and discuss based on the different areas of expertise that they have. Um, another thing that she does is snowballs, she calls it, where just like rolling a snowball down, you take whatever information the first person has and you have to build on it, add another layer of snow, so you can push the snowball a little bit farther so that it gets a little bit bigger and a little bit richer. Um, and that's kind of like that rule of, if somebody already made this point, you can't make this point again, you have to sort of take that and build on it somehow. And there's a third one that I don't remember right now. I'll try to look it up and I'll put, it, I'll put a link to it in the activity sheet. So what were the first two? The first one was jigsaw. And the jigsaw is that you read article one, I read article three, two, and you read article three, and then we come together three different articles, three different perspectives on a single topic, and that way we can come up with some information. We are each experts, like I know stuff because I read the article that you didn't read, so whatever inherent um, inequalities there were as far as like, um, Karen's the smart person in the room, so you know I might not say anything in a discussion, but if I know that she hasn't read my article, that makes me the expert with my article, so it gives me a little bit more confidence to say what my author has to say about the topic. And I can argue on my author's behalf. Um, so that, that idea of jigsaw also that I don't have to read three articles because I can learn from Karen and from you what you guys learned about this. So it's a way for me to do one sort of in-depth primary research type investigation, but also get a couple of other summaries from other people who've done that. And that really encourages the social construction of knowledge which particularly for online, I think is really important. Um, again, going back to my point earlier about alienation um, and that, that just kind of separation from what I see is a separation from deep learning, uh, but that encourages that. They have to work together. Maybe a discussion prompt would be a problem or something that's you know more umbrella that something from each of those readings would be required to be able to answer or respond to effectively. Um, and that then requires them to bring each of their knowledge bits together and work together, so I think that's important. There's another aspect of it that is a peer review uh, element, and it was reflected in that one student's comment of, um, I didn't get any good feedback, but by giving good feedback to other people, it actually helped reinforce my own understanding of things. I think there's a, by, 
having the students share their research papers or their whatever projects that they're working on, they're basically teaching each other about this particular direction that they went. And I think that that's super valuable because they're not just, oftentimes we think that we have the best understanding of things, and so if they just listen to us, they'll get it, but we forget that they're not like us and they understand things differently. So by giving them the opportunity to hear from different perspectives in different words, different languages, um, maybe more relevant age-wise uh, perspectives, they can actually learn more <coughs> from each other than they can from us. Especially in this class, um, I find it really interesting because a lot of these kids have had educational, or just non-educational, but game experiences in their classes growing up, which is not something I had. We had 15 computers in one corner of our entire school that had Oregon Trail on it, but that was it, right? And so uh, it's been really interesting hearing some of their stories about the different games that they played to learn physics or math or something like that. Um, I don't have those examples to give. And if I didn't involve my students in that learning process, those things would never come out. And, and they're able to learn from hearing about each other's experiences. And again, another reason why I find a discussion so important uh, particularly in any situation, but particularly online, because again, you're missing that face-to-face -face piece. So that just being there with other people, and the inevitable somebody saying something at some point that you learn from, unless you explicitly elicit that online, you're not going to get those experiences. So at this point, should we, I'll put this to you guys, should we jump into discussions? How many of you have already used Canvas discussions? All right, so but he's familiar with getting this discussion started. So we'll just skip this part right now. And what I want to do then instead is say, um, tell me a good or terrible discussion experience that you've had, and what have you learned from it? Any good examples that you've seen or done where you're like, wow, that worked out great? Or conversely, any things that you've done where you're like, wow, that was terrible? And I never want to do that again. Or subject my students to that. Yes, Julie. I'll share. And this is actually a group that Karen is involved with. So um, I facilitate a, an interdisciplinary reading group for graduate students. And um, there are, because grad students have such busy schedules, a lot of times not everyone is able to attend the meeting time. Um, with like 40 to 50 people in the group, it's just, it's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was trying to figure out a way for people to participate still in the group without physically attending the meetings. Um, and so I thought, oh, Canvas discussion groups, that would be that would be great. People can contribute their thoughts that way. And it's just, um, it's, so it's not a credit course. So there's not a lot of incentive to, to participate if you're a busy graduate student. And so I was trying to figure out ways to incentivize participation in that way. Um, I found that in the beginning, sort of creating a community by asking folks to introduce themselves and why they're there, what their interests are, like that part goes well. But then actually responding to the readings, um, I've struggled with. So I'm, I'm curious if anybody else has um, suggestions, and Karen especially, and like having, having been involved in the group, like ideas for encouraging participation or um, making it a more valuable experience to participate when there's nothing on the line, no, no credit, no grade. You know, I think it's really interesting because people will, I mean, look at Facebook. There's no incentive to participate on Facebook, but it's incredibly busy, you know what I mean? And people contribute a lot of time to engaging in all sorts of conversations, some minor, some really enlightening. <laughs> um, but why? You know, what makes it different? Why is it that people will spend half an hour responding to an article on whatever, it doesn't matter, uh, but when they're not getting a grade, won't do that in the context of a formal educational institution? Uh, and I don't have an answer to that yet. Uh, lately, I've been reading a lot of Henry Jenkins and uh, participatory cultures and thinking about how, what kinds of lessons we can take from 
the idea of participatory cultures and similar to that, uh, G's ideas of affinity spaces and semiotic social spaces. And what kinds of lessons can we take from that in kind of des making design decisions for online, formal educational online courses, right? Um, I don't have an answer to that yet, but it's the avenue that I'm heading down now. Um, because there's, there's something about sharing and creating and being a producer of, of, of knowledge and of ideas. It is arguably a pretty powerful innate human trait, I think. And there's got to be a way that we can capitalize that in education. I think part of it is the issue that we have such a hierarchy of power in formal education institutions that students don't feel like they have value behind their ideas because there's a teacher. That's who has the value. What's the point of me sharing my ideas if it's not what the teacher's gonna grade well? Um, so that's a bigger issue. Not at all about the way we design things, but about the way that we, as a culture, redefine our educational institutions and not something that anyone can do on their own. Um, that being said, though, I don't think it should be a reason to avoid finding better ways. Um, but I don't know exactly what to, you know, I don't have a solution. I well, I, I'm thinking about your uh, this idea of like power differentials in this mm -hmm. space, and especially like because I, I want to be um, in the role of facilitating and not leading. Right. Um, and so one thing that we've done in this group is um, different um, participants will take the lead and choose the readings and lead the discussion for the next section. So it might be that they start the conversation online rather than rather than me. Maybe that right. could help. John. There, so I think as humans, we know that we are more motivated by and more deeply motivated by intrinsic motivations than by extrinsic motivations. Um, however, it's often the extrinsic motivations that sort of get us going. And I'm thinking of like going to the gym, right? We all definitely want to go to the gym or work out or whatever, whatever. But left to our own devices, it's Oh, it's cold out, I don't know, it's early, whatever, whatever. There's, there's an app out there called Gym Pact, and the idea of the app of Gym Pact is you pay a certain amount of money, and every time you go to the gym, you get a little bit of it back, right? And if you don't go to the gym, and somebody else who's on Gym Pact goes to the gym, they get a chunk of your money. And so basically, <laughs> if you don't, you, if you don't, recap your investment, it's going to somebody else. So the motivation is to go to the gym because I'm gonna to go to the gym, maybe Karen's gonna sleep in tonight, I'm totally gonna to get some of Karen's money for that. I'm wondering if for a self-selected, not for credit group like this, if you can get them to say, commit 10 bucks at the beginning of the semester and we'll give that 10 bucks back to you as you participate in this thing. That might just be for a graduate student who's living on ramen and whatnot, and I, you know, I've been there. Um, that might be just enough of a motivation to sort of get in there and get involved and do what I know is good for me, so I might as well do it, plus I get to you know, have a little happy hour drink or something like that that I've earned over the course of, the, of it. So I, we're looking at, um, for the Delta Effective Teaching with Technology class that I lead, um, we started looking at Badger, badging, program for Canvas, and I'm generally opposed to sort of the gamification of educational classes and such, but I think that there's something worth exploring there, and it, it would be interesting. If any one of you want to join that, um, I'll let you into the class, we can figure out badges together, that'd be possible. That'd be um, we're thinking about something similar within the libraries, uh, especially since we offer a lot of, I think I've mentioned this in this space before, we offer a lot of online, um, <coughs> or a lot of uh, classes for graduate students that meet the different um, Discover PD professional development right. um, learning objectives through the graduate school, and we were thinking like, 
um, a lot of grad students attend these, it'd be great if they could get some sort of marker that they've mm -hmm. attended this extra training or right. learned this extra tool. Come join my kitchen. Join, join, the, 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 join my little badger class. We're gonna, let's figure this out. Yeah. I think more and more, it's still, it's wild west right now as far as <laughs> how do we give credit for people participating other than standard points in an enrolled class. And I think that we're, it's getting better. We're starting to figure out some of the things. We're not there yet, but it's going to get better. Julie, have you considered doing that group entirely online? Mm, not yet, because the engagement online has been so dismal. But maybe that's because there is the face-to-face -face side. I don't know. Maybe a possibility. We have to talk about it. There is something about needing, in order to engage in a space, you have to actually live in the space. Like Facebook, we would not be comfortable with if it were a thing that we did sort of on the side um, every once in a while that we had to go to. Um, but because, <coughs> because it's on my app all the time, and it's just a little button press away, and I'm in, it's easy. Like the bar and the entry bars is easy. Getting into a Canvas course is for the university now pretty easy. Like I, early learning management systems, you had to do these logins, you had to remember your password. You know, who remembers your password anymore? That's what LastPass and password managers are for. Um, so things are easier now to get into it. So the bar is lowering and the ability to live in these spaces is good. On the other hand, which of the spaces, I've got you know, 50 online spaces, which one do I live in? And what's my incentive for living in one versus the other? Well, all my friends are in Facebook, so therefore I'm gonna live in Facebook or Twitter or whatever. Um, but you know, if I had a good social network for promoting graduate work, maybe I would live there more. But I have to have it open more. Other stories, good examples, good assignments that you've seen or terrible assignments that you've seen. And you don't have to say that they're yours. They can say, no, a friend of a friend. Yes? Well, I've done terribly with my first discussion board. When I assigned the small groups, I had a set, set of dates. So complete the initial post on this date, and your first review on the second day, and then the post on this date. But I didn't check on them. And there were uh, people who didn't post, so the discussion didn't go on. So those who were supposed to come out and the post didn't have anyone to post for. Mm -hmm. So people were active, but they didn't have opportunity to respond. And that was horrible. I didn't know how to go out of that, so I allowed some later posts. So people who participated in contributed. So it was it was a pain mm -hmm. <laughs> after that. So you know, I, I mentioned that I'd stayed out of this intentionally. But there was one group who I think, <coughs> so like I said, I was on vacation from Thursday to Tuesday, so I posted this all the stuff Thursday morning before I left. And I think it was like Saturday or so that I checked, and there was one group nobody had done anything yet. And I did post. I said, hey, group one, let's get going. And they did. But, but yeah, no, I, other than that, yeah, that's definitely, uh, and rubrics, I think, is another, in terms of grading a discussion, that's where there's value to, I always include in my rubric for an online, online course, <clears throat> that you get timeliness points and you get full credit if you post by this date and it drops down point value for waiting longer and longer. Um, and it's only a small portion, it's not going to kill your grade because of course I still want you to participate. The participation and the learning is what's important to me, not the timeliness, but it does affect their grade and for some that's three points plenty to be motivating enough to get on it. There's a thing about <coughs> discomfort that we have to like get over sometimes and I think having an active guide in a space is a good way to do that. Do any of you remember Second Life? <laughs> Second Life was this online platform where you could have a little avatar and go walk around and I don't know, explore? <laughs> You could have your avatar dance um, at virtual clubs and things like that. Um, and there were interesting things to see, but a lot of it was just sort of you're walking around and there's a lot of dead spaces. And every once in a while you'd get to a place and you'd see people doing stuff at that place and you'd be like, oh, I wonder what's happening here. 
But the same concept, I think, occurs in a discussion space. Or Facebook, like if nobody posted on Facebook, it would not be an exciting place to go. It would just be a bunch of ads, right? Um, but we go there because every once in a while, in between the ads, we see our friends update, and there's some sort of action or excitement in discussions on posts and things like that. There are things happening. Um, and if you as an instructor are not in the discussion, helping students sort of get started, um, you get in there and you do some modeling, the teacher presence, you show that there are people there, you give them a sense that, look, it's valuable being here because you can leave with some information that you didn't come in with. Um, that gets things started and then, okay, now you've got two people in there and the third person joins in and you can kind of, hey, meet each other and then you just leave the conversation a little bit and go help two other people uh, get into a discussion. But that we need to, we can't just build things and they'll come um, and they'll stay we might, they might come, but they might be like, this is boring, or I'm not engaged here. So they have to go. So it's important to be active in those spaces, I think. Yes? You mentioned the rubric on the discussion. Mm -hmm. Do you have an example you could show us of how that looks for us? Is I it for don't. the student, or is it for the instructor? Uh, both <coughs> down there? On we the have, active learning course? We have several. We have um, a couple in the active uh, teaching course that you can actually use if you'd like. There are other examples on the link here. Uh, da, 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 da. Probably on the second page. Yes, yeah, so on the second page, uh, on the point five there, there, we have some that you can, if you're part of the active teaching course, then you can self-enroll on the first top instructions here. I think and then you'll have a, a chance to be able to find those discussions, or sorry, those rubrics yourself. Mm -hmm. Are they being tied to a discussion or no? They are not tied to a discussion, they are under a rubric. They're just, yeah. So when you go find rubrics for those discussions? I've, I've done rubric, you know, under um, under assignments. I just didn't know kind of what it looked like. And is it used more for the student to do the peer evaluation or for the faculty to do this? I think it's both. Okay. And we're going to be talking about rubrics in a couple of weeks. Okay. Um, and we're going to be talking about both sides of those of that, that equation. Perfect. How does it help students um, show them what they should look for yeah. or what they should do, but also how does it make grading easier? Okay, so, perfect. Uh, but we have we have a, a link to several examples of discussions on, on the next page. Okay. I will say though that if you want terminology and functionality of Canvas here is something that I haven't addressed outright, but there's a couple of things that might be confusing. One is that I've used the words peer review and Canvas has a peer review function, not what I was doing. Okay. Then you can include a rubric in a peer review assignment, Canvas function. And then the students would fill out that rubric. Then you, as an instructor, could add a rubric to an assignment that you would use to grade, and the student could see that and help guide how they're creating their assignment, right? Because they know what they're grading on. So a couple of different things okay. happening there. Uh -huh. um, yeah, so just to point that out. You've had two active teaching labs. Um, Johnson Brunnen and Tim Austin have both done the peer review process where they had students give each other's reviews on their papers. <coughs> I think if I remember correctly, John also did it in discussions. Um, but one of the things that uh, Johnson Brunnen pointed out was that the peer reviews really, or sorry, the rubrics really, the peer reviews, really saved him a lot of time because the students caught 85% of what mm -hmm. he would have caught. So that's 85% less typing that he has to do and <coughs> scanning through. And then he just scans through and he says, oh, there's this thing too, and he can add something else. And then they've got great feedback, or, and then he can add to their comments saying also what the others have said. Mm -hmm. And so it, it's, a, it's a good time saver. But again, to the point that that one student made, just by looking through other people's examples, our peers' examples, we learn a lot. Yeah. There is a rubric attached to this discussion. Awesome. But I don't know if it's set up as a peer review. I don't think this is set up as a peer review discussion. So. There's, so the peer review option opened at 925, oh. but then I extended the due date because we were running a little late. So I don't know how that will work because now the peer review time is sure. before <laughs> the due date of the assignment. So I can do a little. I, I uh, and I know we're beyond time now, so uh, we I have used the peer review functionality in Canvas, um, 
And so I'm happy to talk to anybody about my experience with that, but I won't do it now. All right, any last questions before we go? Otherwise, help me thank Karen for coming in today and sharing your <laughs> And please fill out your little green forms for us. Um, it was very helpful. Grab an extra bacon with another cup of coffee on your way out.